You're listening to the Mind Over Finger podcast, episode number 123. Welcome to the Mind Over Finger podcast, discussions on mindful music making, efficient practice, and building a purposeful career. And now, your host, violinist, teacher, and high performance coach for musicians, Dr. Rene Paul Gautier. Hi, everyone. I hope this episode finds you doing amazingly well. If you're hearing this right now, it means that enrollment for the Music Mastery Experience is officially open. If you're ready to crack the code to start performing at your best, to experience fulfillment in your music career, then the Music Mastery Experience was made for you. If you're done with not seeing results with the endless amount of work, of time and energy that you put in the practice room, then you're ready to walk through the doors that will take you inside of the Music Mastery Experience. Go to mindoverfinger.com right now to book your free conversation with me and get your transformation started today. And stay tuned after the interview for more details. Today on the episode, I'm really excited to speak with someone that I've heard about for years and who's highly regarded by everyone I've talked to as both an incredible performer and outstanding pedagogue. Joseph Alessi has been principal trombone of the New York Philharmonic since the spring of 1985 after holding positions with the Philadelphia Orchestra and the Montreal Symphony. He's an active soloist, recitalist, and chamber music performer. He's performed as a soloist with several of the world's best orchestras, playing standard repertoire and premiering new works often written for him. Joe also performs in numerous festivals across the world, and his discography includes releases on many labels, both as a solo artist and with world-class ensembles of all types. Joe is currently on the faculty of the Juilliard School, and his students occupy positions with many major symphony orchestras in the U.S. and internationally. As a clinician for the Eastman Shires Instrument Company, he's also given master classes throughout the world and has toured Europe extensively as a master teacher and recitalist. In our conversation, he shares wonderful wisdom on many topics, including the importance of fundamentals, the types of mindset that are helpful to nurture, tips on performance preparation, helpful habits to adopt, and so much more. I know that you're going to find this discussion really interesting and will take a lot of Joe's insight with you in the practice room today. Let's go to the show. Joseph Alessi, it's a great honor to have you on the show today. Thank you. I'm honored to be invited. Joe, I'm so excited to talk with you today. I'm not even a brass player myself, but I have to say that I'm a little bit starstruck. It's so fun for me to have this chance to sit with an amazing artist and pedagogue such as yourself. I have so many questions for you about practicing and performing, about learning and teaching. But before I dive into all of this, I'd love for the listeners to get to hear your story in your own words. So can you please share with us how your artistic journey has unfolded? Well, I, I'm from California. My parents were uh, in the Metropolitan Opera. They moved from New York to California in the early 60s. So my father's a trumpet player. My mother was a singer at the Met. So when uh, my, my father started me on the trumpet when I was very young, maybe about five, and I switched over to trombone when I was eight. And uh, anyway, he was my first teacher. He sat me down and taught me how to make the embouchure and make uh, the, you know, how to do rhythms. And, uh, you know, he was very adamant uh, and the way things should go and how your rhythm was supposed to be. And, and he showed me all of that. And then my mother was, I listened to her for the phrasing and, and the, uh, the feeling of the music. Uh, so she would vocalize all the time in the house. And my brother is a fantastic jazz trumpet player. So it was a, a, a family of musicians, and uh, music was 
our lives. That was what we did. And I was involved with sports as well. Uh, some baseball I did. So it wasn't just music, of course. But when I was 16, I joined the Musicians Union and uh, I started working right away. I graduated uh, high school in three years. So I did, had all the credits and I figured, you know, why not move into uh, some a professional situation? So I won a, a job with the San Francisco Ballet Orchestra. And uh, that was great to do that for a year. And then my mother said, you know, you really have to go to college. And so I auditioned for the Curtis Institute and spent three years there and um, went into the Philadelphia Orchestra when I was 20. And Ricardo Muti hired me uh, there. He was my boss. And, um, and then I uh, auditioned for the Montreal Symphony and went up there for about seven months to work with Charles, Charles Dutois and uh, Orchestra Symphonique de, Mont de Montreal. So, and uh, anyway, that was great. I met my wife there, uh, and she's a violist. She played in the orchestra. And then I won the New York Philharmonic job. So I've been there 36 years. Zubin Mate hired me there. So, yeah, it's gone by very quickly. That's a pretty great road. Mm -hmm. I'm very fortunate. I can't imagine writing... And, you know, if I had to do it all over again, I'd do the same thing. Mm. Joe, as I was preparing for this conversation, I read some interviews, watched videos, and I invite everyone listening to actually Google your name and watch any video out there where you are featured. And I'll have some links in the show notes as well. And I also spoke with a lot of my trombone player colleagues here. And first of all, they all speak of you so highly. I'm told that you are extremely funny and excellent company. Uh -huh. And when it comes to music making, what I hear is that you are very mindful that you have very high standards and expectations for yourself combined with an amazing mindset. And so I would love to cover these two components. Uh, we need to have the rigorous, efficient work when we practice and the mindset that will allow us to perform at our best and not only perform well under pressure, but also hopefully enjoy it, right? So can we start with efficient work? What is mindful, efficient practice to you? What does that look like in the practice room? Well, we, we talked about this yesterday on my webinar. I have a webinar that I do for my Lessie Music Studios. It's once a month. So I decided to just concentrate on fundamentals and uh, even with a simple exercise, you know, some scales or, or whatever, um, you can multitask and have multiple goals when you practice something. So you could practice, for instance, with the metronome or without the metronome. Mm -hmm. And you could put the metronome on beat one, traditional, one, two, three, four. Or you could practice and make, when you uh, start whatever you're playing, then the metronome becomes the offbeat. So you could reverse that. Uh, you could practice um, singing it and conducting it. So I'm really big on that. Uh, you know, to try how to practice and not waste your face and get the music in your head. Uh, and then that way you can transfer it to the instrument uh, very easily. So you can practice that way. You can practice with different dynamics. Uh, you know, a lot of these simple exercises don't have dynamics. So they might have one dynamic. Uh, why not practice, uh, you know, eight bars, you know, mezzo forte and the next eight bars pianissimo and, and really test yourself dynamically as well. So I think young musicians don't really challenge themselves dynamically. Mm. They, they'll just kind of play in one, one uh, dynamic for a long time. And that's, that's tough for them to, to deal with when it's demanded. So anyway, uh, and knowing how to breathe. Okay. Of course is huge where to breathe. Uh, you know, the standard breath is before you play is, you know, 
very slow and 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 deep but you have to learn how to breathe uh, as a wind player you have to know how to breathe very quickly as well so some some even in your when you do your scales you can be very creative that way and also different styles you know practice legato practice staccato uh, in a scale don't just do a scale the same way um, of course know your scales is really <laughs> important um, so I the other day I I taught another young uh, student who didn't really practice a lot of scales anybody who doesn't practice scales it's it's kind of correlates to uh, lack of fundamentals you know in their playing and then we have teachers who don't stress that enough and then when they uh, when they recommend uh, when they work on a student with a very difficult piece with not great fundamentals, it's really hard on the student because they have to do all these strange things, and it's it never sounds comfortable or easy. It's forced. Uh, rhythm is not particularly good. Intonation is not really that great, and so it's it's that's why when I work with students, I always test them on their fundamentals. So let's somebody, say somebody comes to my house from Virginia or Texas or whatever, and I don't know they're playing. The first thing I'll have them do is play some scales and just see how they do with that. And their their approach to a scale, is it just mindless playing or is it something that has rhythm to it and form to it? And do they are they playing with good technique with the slide? And, you know, there's all these things that have to happen in a scale. And if they don't happen in the scale, then they're definitely not going to happen in a difficult uh, concerto or etude. Right. One of the fundamentals that I always talk about with my clients and students is the concept of beginner's mind. What was lesson number one? And oftentimes people try to practice a difficult passage and they'll go to the elaborate techniques and then you realize they don't even know the names of the notes, like you said, if you don't even know your scales. So really going back to these fundamentals that you're mentioning is so important. Well, that's the way I start with my own practice. I just start over every day. Mm. You know, I start from the very beginning, you know, and just long tones and scales. And I don't just take out something very difficult and play it. I like to ground myself every day and, and be able to do something very easy and try to do it very well. Uh, if you can do that, then you can graduate to other uh, levels of difficulty in your playing. So I agree with you on that. Yeah, absolutely. Another thing that I've heard and read you mention many times also that I think is so important for everyone to hear is the importance of having a very clear image in our head first to really hear the music ahead of time. Can you speak to that a little bit? Well, that's all from the singing and conducting. Because if somebody <laughs> sings or somebody's uh, a student will come and, and they're not used to singing, you know, listen, when I was uh, in eighth grade, did I sing in, in front of my mother? Not really. <laughs> you know, that, I was embarrassed to do that. But, you know, I do it in the shower or something or, you know, where I think nobody could hear it. But I encourage my students to sing. And, and when they do, if they sing with, no feeling and no interest, da, 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 and then the, the, there's no um, coordination between the conducting. So I always combine it with conducting. And if you can, it's like, you know, patting your head and rubbing your tummy. Um, mm -hmm. But if, but when they do it, they don't have to have great voices. Neither do I when I sing. It's an average voice. But they have to do it with purpose, you know, and they have to pick out a goal note in the phrase, okay, and they have to identify that, and um, they need to be an architect when they mm. do a phrase. So they have to find that point, go to it, and away from it. And if you, if they don't, and when they, I'm talking about singing, when they if they don't do it when they sing, they're certainly not going to do it when they play. Yeah, you know. So uh, it's really to have the concept of of yeah how it should go and and teach the student about phrasing so that they know to go to a certain note and away from it, uh, help, help them and ask them questions. Hey, what do you think 
is the most important? Which note is the most important note in this phrase? And get them to think about that. Yeah. Um, so you know, once they get that going and then they can conduct and sing and they can have a plan, you know, then, then it's a lot easier to do, uh, do it on the instrument. So yes, you have to have, and you have to hear the sound that you want, of course. What is the actual sound you want? And what is the music making behind it? So mm -hmm. rhythm and with the conducting and singing with the pitch. And the pitch has to be correct. You know, when they sing it, they can't be going off pitch. How can you be a musician and, you know, play an instrument and not send the right signal from your brain, you know, into the instrument? Um, right. And that also, you have, on the trombone at least, we have the slide. So uh, the problem with the slide is when we learn the uh, trombone, we have to find a reference point. Mm -hmm. And everybody touches the bell to find third position. Everybody knows where first position is because it's all the way in. And when you when you were a young kid, you you could probably only get out the seventh, uh, sorry, sixth position, even though there was another position there, because your arm was too short. So mm -hmm. that was sixth position, and then the other positions. So you know, third position was touching the bell, and then second position obviously was in between first and third positions. You could figure that out. Fourth position, you had to use your thumb to. Uh, to make a uh, make a reference for the you know for fourth position that's how you found it wait mm -hmm. when you started uh there's no there's no colors on your slide you know they, they didn't make the trombones with colors you know and and oh i'm gonna put put my uh slide at this color and then it'll work no they didn't they didn't the manufacturers didn't make the instrument that way can't so, put tape then, like on a violin <laughs> no you, can, you can't really yeah because the slide will stop you know there's yeah it's it does a stop but the fifth position nobody really knew where that was at all so mm -hmm. so anyway what i try to do is the the instrument will light up i call it light up with the correct sound if you put the position in the right place okay and you're you can hear that note okay as well and of course you know supporting and and so forth like that but it really changes quite a bit when uh when they find the exact position so they don't they stop using these reference points with your fingers and so forth and uh, you know many students will touch the bell and you know there's great professionals that touch the bell so don't get me wrong but in the classical world it's it's more common i think uh not to touch the bell to get the right the right sound you know mm -hmm. and uh so anyway that's that's a, that's a big factor as well so if you what you hear and then what you where you place your your slide you know in the exact spot without looking at the bell and that's the problem because on a trombone the bell's right there you can yeah. the only way you can only only way you can uh not look at it is close your eyes so or there's an instrument behind me here I use for teaching. The bell is uh, sent off in a different direction. I bent the bell to the left, so it's out of view. Uh, mm. So I've I've used that for teaching. So uh, so that's why I tell my students when they practice their scales, practice them with your eyes closed. Mm -hmm. You know, so you're not looking at all the reference point. Yeah, mind over finger. <laughs> well, there there it is. There it is. Yeah, there, there, for definitely in in this case, it's yeah. Get that finger out of there. So anyway. <laughs> Joe, how about that mindset that I mentioned earlier? Because I see it so much. We practice. And then there's that part of wishful thinking. You hope that the work you do in the practice room will translate on stage. What I see a lot of people skipping is that part where they bring the stage in the practice room with them every day and prepare for performance. What does that look like for you? Yeah. So, you know, in my studio at Juilliard, you know, the students know they have to come prepared. And even if they are prepared, I'll take the piece apart and put it, we'll try to put it back together. And the student has to be able to be flexible and, and be adaptable uh, when we work on this. And it throws them off their game a little bit. Mm -hmm. If, you know, we, we put a breath mark here or they, I ask them to wear a different dynamic or we working on their intonation. And sometimes they get a little flustered, you know. And, and so uh, you have to be able to handle the pressure of, of, you know, going into the studio 
And and if the, if, if if any teacher asks or demands or suggests something, you have to be able to go with that and and be able to come up with you know the changes. So that kind of pressure, you'll feel that amount of pressure, but it doesn't it's not equal to the pressure that maybe you will have when you perform or when you go to an audition, okay? So I have to I tell the students, "Hey, you know, you're familiar with my teaching and you know I'm demanding, but you're still familiar with that. You you won't be familiar uh, unless you've done it uh, hundreds of times or not hundreds, maybe 50 times or 20 times, maybe hopefully less. You know, when you go to an audition, it's a lot more pressure. So you have to put that kind of pressure on yourself when you practice. Yeah. So I like to have them record to put that pressure on themselves. So to, that, anytime I record, and that's what I do here in the studio right after this interview, I'm, I'm going to record a few things. And, you know, when you hit that button, the red button, you know, you got to come up and you have to come up with your best playing. Mm -hmm. So, and you want to come up to a, a certain standard. So I, I ask the students to record themselves so that they become the teachers and they can make their own criticism of themselves. And that seems to prepare them for the real world if they do that and also have some time in the practice period where they, they'll work on something and they'll do exploratory work or they'll be a scientist and they'll, they'll experiment, okay? And that's how you improve. But after taking apart an etude and putting it back together again, which is what you really should do, you need to perform it, yeah. you know, and put that pressure on yourself. Because when you come into the studio, you, you've already felt that pressure in your practice room yeah. from the imaginary performance that you create. And that's what's so interesting is if we really think about it, between the practice room and the stage, the only thing that is changing is what we're thinking. In one situation, we are thinking that the stakes are lower, and in the other one, we're thinking that the stakes are higher. So it's how can we manage what we're thinking about the notes that we're about to play to recreate the kind of environment that we want to experience. So either bringing the stage in the practice room or feeling fully confident on stage. Yeah. And when you, when you go on stage, obviously it's people are listening and, or if you go to an audition, there's a committee listening and you really have to just say, you know, I don't want to use any bad words, but you really have to just say, you know, the heck with this. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just, I don't really care about these people at all. Um, I mean, I mean, maybe my, my brother or my mother, I might care about or whatever in the audience, but it's, you really just have to have that mindset. Hey, I'm just going to do my own thing here. Yeah. And if they like it, great. If they don't, well, too bad, you know, and then that, that, you know, you've worked really hard on what you've done. And I, I've used that technique when I, when I auditioned for the Montreal symphony, matter of fact, I use that technique and that was one of the best auditions I've ever played. Mm -hmm. I just went into a, a mirror, went to the dressing room. I had a talk with myself in the mirror. And I just said, you know, I've worked hard for this. You need to go out, concentrate, do what you're supposed to do. Whatever happens, I will stay on track, you know, and, and present, be musical and present my musical product. Yeah. That is a good way, I think, to, to think of it as well. Because, yeah, there's the pressure of it. But how do you deal with that pressure? You, you put pressure against the pressure let's put it that way and just say you know i don't care about this pressure i'm going to just do my own thing mm -hmm. and and that that's a little bit li liberating i think yes i think liberating is a great way because we're not going to be a different player we're going to be the same player but with the thoughts that we choose to nurture right before we're about to hop on stage can help us or get in the way so that's that's a fantastic mm -hmm. way Well, yeah, nerves can change all that. But I was talking with Lauren Mazel about nerves one day, and and he was, you know, the only said the only reason why we get nervous is because we want to protect our ego. Mm, yeah. And so he said, you really, you, you can't be afraid to fail. One hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, I love this, Joe. You mentioned your studio. You have, by the way, so many amazing resources on your website. I'll have, of course, the link in the show notes, and I invite everyone to visit. You have the Alessi Music Studio, which looks like just such a wonderful um, 
point of rally for all trombone players. And I'm going to ask you to tell us more about this at the end. And I know that you have some seminars you teach at Juilliard, as you've mentioned. Can you talk to us a little bit about teaching and studying? There's two things in particular I would love to cover with you is your approach to teaching, but also what you would recommend young musicians, the, the type of philosophy they adopt as students. So can we start with your approach to teaching? Well, yeah, you, you really have to teach the students how to teach themselves. Okay, so that's, that's really what it's about. So, um, for instance, if we were in a lesson and, and a student will play an etude, so the etude to me is a, a test, a weekly test on where you are. Okay, so mm -hmm. uh, if, if the test fails, then you have to go back to fundamentals, okay, and immediately. And, you know, the test, that test can fail in a number of ways, the intonation, the rhythm, uh, your sound's not correct, or whatever. So, but if, if they pass that test, that's, that's great, you know, because they've studied all those things and put it in the etude. Mm. And then you can, it's a barometer, really, on where they are. You know, if it's a technical etude, okay, there's certain things that have to happen. Accuracy, consistency, the articulation, the slide, like all these things come together. And and um, they all come together on, with rhythm. So rhythm is, if you're, built, if you're baking a cake, okay, you know, it's a layered cake, okay, you, the first layer is going to be rhythm. Everything is produced. Your sound is produced with rhythm. Your 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 tongue is rhythmically moves rhythmically. Your slide moves rhythmically. Uh, you know the technique of how to hold the slide is so important for rhythm. So all these things, if you got to have the, the great rhythm in your head, and that's this is why again I have them conduct. So um, so if the rhythm is hundred really great, then. All those other layers you put on top, uh, you know, are easy to 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 produce, are much easier to produce. So, anyway, uh, in the in the studio, I usually have them play the etude, and I don't disrupt them. I let them play from beginning to end. And let's say they make a mistake, and I ask them. I said, please, if you make a mistake, don't stop. Mm -hmm. So it's important to be able to go from the beginning to the end. And it's a journey, you know, <laughs> if you go to the grocery store, okay, some days it's going to be easy. Some days it's not. You're going to run into traffic. You're going to run into weather, you know, but you got to get there, <laughs> you know. So, yeah. uh, so they have to learn how to start and finish something. And then once that happens, and, and they feel the pressure too, because, you know, a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of times you'll start something. And in the beginning of an etude, you won't feel that pressure. Yeah. So oh, I'm doing great, you know. And then as you go along, you might uh, you might have to deal with you know your your air. You're getting a little bit more depleted with your air, and you feel that pressure. Or let's say uh, you get some saliva in your mouth or whatever. You know, uh, you have to know how to deal with that and keep going. You yeah. can't stop. You know, so that etude is so important, and it's not uncommon for a student to repeat an etude. Mm -hmm. You know, so we work on these things, and then I show them. What to work on? I say, now look, look at all the things we worked on in this etude. You have to do this to yourself in the practice room. You have to be like a, a Sherlock Holmes out there and just sniffing around or for things that you could do better or ways that you could do it better by placing a breath in a different place or pausing a little bit. You know, if you, how much time you take after a fermata. Uh, you know, and the dr the drama that you create with something like that, if you take time, but you also get a little rest too, you know, uh, to, to digest. You just did let the listener digest, let yourself digest what you just played. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, you have to, they have to be able to think like I think. <laughs> so, and, and really, you know, it's, I don't want to be sound too overconfident about that, but I just tell them, you know, please think like I think in the practice room. Mm -hmm. And if you can do that, then you can, you know, you can teach yourself. And then they have to record everything they play, you know, in the, in, as they practice. Mm -hmm. Or take it apart, put it together, have that recording thing on, a device on, and then 
uh, listen, listen back immediately and, and, and just have your music there. This way you get a break with your face, you know, you're just listening. And so, yeah, the listening part of it is huge. So they know what to listen for. My job is to tell them what to listen for. Okay. And in the, in the, in the, uh, category of, of intonation, uh, you know, people say, well, how do I fix intonation? Well, I get them to sing, of course. I'll, I'll put them at the piano and get them to buzz a note and play it on the piano. Or, sorry, play the piano first and close your eyes. Just play any note, okay? And then buzz it immediately. Hmm. And so they can they can do that very quickly. So that's one way of doing that. But another way is just if I correct their intonation, so I get, I get, the, I, I'll correct their intonation. I'm like the intonation police, I call it. <laughs> and, and, and I, I said, you know, when I talk to you about intonation, I want you to write the tendency of that note in your part. Okay. And so they'll put an arrow up and up or down and, you know, they have to tune it flatter or sharper or whatever. And they're listening, but I'm actually getting getting them to listen differently to themselves yeah. from so many times of correcting their intonation. So for a freshman, for instance, a first year student, I'll, unless they're, you know, off the charts, you know, I'll correct their intonation five or six times in, in the lesson. Yeah. At least, you know. So if I do that weekly, I sort of get them to retrain their ears and, and to hear themselves in a different way. And that's the key, really, for them to yeah. learn how to listen. Yes. Yeah, so that, that's the ultimate goal is so they can go into the practice room and teach themselves. Yeah. Then, you, then you're, you're, you're successful as a teacher. And I love what you said about being able to play through despite the mistakes. I compare that to the hurdle races. So, you know, the athlete might learn mm. the fundamentals to run and the fundamentals to jump. But then they learn how to run the race. They can't just start running. And if they knock the hurdle down, they have, you know, stop, put it back up, <laughs> and run, jump over again. They have to know how to recover. Yeah. To recover. Yeah. So you finish the race, then you look back how many you knocked down, figure out why, and then race again. But you, you got to be able to finish the race. Very true. And it, it's, yeah, I try to do that when I practice, you know, same thing. Let's get through this whole first movement see how I feel. And then the next time around, I'm going to try to be a little bit more efficient with the effort that I put out so that I can feel a little bit better at the end of that first movement. Mm, I love that. Joe, one question I ask all the guests at the end when I do the round of rapid fire question is usually what they think young musicians should learn in addition to play their instruments. And I feel that that ties in with what I was saying earlier in terms of taking ownership of their learning experience. Why do you feel like young musicians right now, or not so young musicians, all musicians, what can they do to really take control of that learning experience? You were talking about how they need to learn how to listen to themselves and be a detective. What else? Mm -hmm. Well, I have one student, he, in, he has an injury on his face, so he hasn't been able to play. And, you know, he's at school, he's going to classes and having our lessons. And, and so t he has the time to do this now. So I, I said, really learn repertoire, you know, learn orchestral repertoire that you may not know. And I gave him a whole folder of music. Go through, if you see something that you haven't listened to, listen to it and get a score, you know, get a score and study the score. And, you know, I said, while you're doing the score, to preface this, uh, I asked him to conduct a little bit. Can you do four, four times, five, four, three, four? Can you do seven, eight? And he could do all that stuff. Hmm. He knew how to do it. I said, where did you learn that? Well, I did a conducting class in, at, you know, a summer camp one year or something like that. So, well, great. Well, you're going to listen to the music, you're going to follow the score, and you're going to conduct along with it, you know. So, uh, so that's that's what he's doing, and he's, you know, he's also doing a lot of other listening. Now, I asked, you know, what uh, this, for instance, the scales we talked about. For me, when I warm up, uh, since I love jazz, and I'm I'm uh, very interested in in the in in that. 
and, and knowing how to do it, instead of doing my normal scales, I'll do the altered scale, or I'll do the, the diminished scale, or I'll do, do a whole list of uh, arpeggios, the major seventh, the major sixth, the dominant seventh, I'll do the, the minor, minor seventh, I'll do the minor sixth, I'll do the minor major, uh, tri, you know, triad. I'll do the or arpeggio. I'll do the uh, half diminished. Uh, I'll do my augmented. I'm going to do the, uh, you know, the flat five and sharp seven uh, arpeggio. So I'm I'm trying to do my warm up and and my practicing, but I'm doing it now in all these different, you know, unusual things that classical musicians don't usually practice but you can play in these class in a classical way and still study these chords you know mm -hmm. what i mean and or practice in the circle of fourths mm -hmm. you know that's that's a great way to practice so when you do your scales do them in this or do anything like any passage you practice to go up a fourth and do the same passage uh you know as a jazz player for sure so anyway uh you have to be th three-dimensional Okay, so that's that's a term I mm -hmm. like to use with my students. You know, uh, a one-dimensional player is okay. This is a player that plays really nice legato, has a nice sound, plays in tune, but that's all they can do. You know, they they're not doing dynamics, they're not uh, phrasing, uh, you know, logically. Uh, they're not changing the dynamic when the material changes in the, in the music. Okay, so they they don't associate that. So I just say, hey, it's like turning a book, a page in a, in a book to a, no, a new chapter. Uh, when that happens, you see that happen in the music, bring a new color or a new dynamic to the music. So it's it's really learning how to be three-dimensional. Mm -hmm. And and that's, uh, you know, a young player, they think, oh, I'm going to play the notes. Okay. And, and sometimes I'll ask the question, you know, that, that you did that really well, you you did that really well. You played all the notes. Um, what what what's next? What would you say you need to do next? You know. And so if if I ask the students questions, mm. I like to do that. Get them to think for them. You know, to try to figure out the correct answer, yeah. according to me. Yeah. Yeah. Asking questions. That's where it is, right? Yeah. Yeah. Joe, what's a what's a habit that you have that you think contributed to your success? probably planning mm. planning so i remember remember uh in high school we had jazz band at 7 30 in the morning every morning five days a week and this is this is horrible for a brass player who a young brass player because you walk into jazz band you play all this stuff and you you're not really quite warmed up mm -hmm. you know at that time of day and to get warmed up you know uh, you have to plan it. So you have to, you know, obviously wake up earlier, but then, Hey, how, how am I going to get a nice warm up in and, and, and for the things that I need? So I remember at a young age, I would pick out um, a plan. I made a, a warm up plan for myself and, and that really helped me tremendously. And I kind of used that in, in my own practice throughout the years that, uh, you know, to, first of all, show the, students to lay out the the practice schedule okay and be able to do uh, 30 or 40 minute sessions uh uh where where they're goal oriented sessions and you have a, a plan hey i'm in this session i'm going to cover you know these three things mm -hmm. okay or out of these you know i'm going to work out of three different books and and in that in a certain order and then this next session, you know, after resting, I'm going to do a melodious etude and I'm going to do it in different registers. OK, so if you plan out your practicing like that and get it structured, uh, you know, then I think it's much more um, productive with the goals that you want. And uh, so I think that's probably one of the reasons why I, I was successful. And I think music showed me how to be successful, you know, so in other um, aspects, you know, whether you're going to repair something or, you're, or let's say you're going to, you know, I golf a little bit, 
And so, you know, I, that's that to me, the golfing and music, uh, are very similar. Yeah. <laughs> so, so anyway, it's taught me how to be, you know, organized and at least respect, uh, fundamentals as well. So I respect fundamentals in golf and, and I'm always trying to learn, uh, watch a golf video or in, tutorial and see what I can, and I'll go out on the range and try some of these things. And, uh, uh, so anyway, it's, it's the mental game also of golf is very much like music. So. Yes. And that's a great book there. The inner game of golf. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Somebody, somebody just gave that to me. Yeah. Oh, it's good. I, I like it actually yeah. even more than the inner game of tennis, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. Joe, how yep. about a quick actionable tip that the listeners could implement in their musical lives? I mean, there's the old one where the the faster you the faster you practice, the slower your progress is, and the slower you practice, the faster your progress is. Yeah. Uh, quoting uh, Itzhak Perlman, you know that's that's very true. I w- I would just say I would just say do simple things very well on the instrument. Okay, take the simplest thing you could practice, or you can just do three note a three note. Make up a three note exercise, or you're going to play an exercise and you're going to mix up the notes in any order you want, in any rhythm that you want, okay, in any style that you want, and you're going to practice and make and and make it sound great in 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 a slow way, okay. So you can do it very slowly, so that your 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 mind is working and you're creating uh, a way of doing things. Um, just on the spot, but also you're working on your technique at the same time and your sound at the same time. So it can be just a three note exercise. And if, the, if you don't want to have it be random, okay, just say, Hey, I'm going to go just up and down these three notes, you know, at a slow speed, I'm going to work on my legato mm-hmm. and, and sound. I love that. Very powerful yeah. in its simplicity and elegance. Thanks. Joe, can you tell us a little bit more about all of these amazing resources that you have available for people? I will invite, again, everybody to go on your website. It's slideareacom I'll have that information in the show notes, but I know that you have the Alessi Seminar and the Music Studio, which is sounds like a wonderful resource. Well, yeah, the, the Alessi Music Studios uh, is, is really innovative. Uh, mm-hmm. my, my, my website slide area is just sort of about me and maybe my schedule and as a place, if you want to buy a recording or, and they should uh, buy a want... recording. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, it's just, it's just about my background, uh, some resources as far as, uh, you know, some websites I like, etc. So that's more of informative, uh, about me. But the the Alessi Music Studios is really about teaching everything I can think about uh, regarding teaching. So on the site, uh, you have my warm up, okay, and it's an interactive warm up. So there are little modules that you have. So I'm looking at it right now. But there's a, a warm up module. There's an etude melodious etude module that you can play with a piano. You can hear me play those same etudes. Um, and uh, there's my recordings. I've recordings I've made of excerpts for people to listen to. There's a, a ton of video tutorials uh, talking about all different aspects of playing and auditions and you name it. Uh, there's a, a, a there's a module on a on a famous book called Arbon's uh, Arbon, excuse me, and that's how to practice it. And then there's an interesting module called the orchestra orchestra machine, which is a digital orchestra that you can practice mm-hmm. with, um, and you can you can practice an excerpt uh, in many different ways, different. You know, a practice tempo, for instance, there's exercises about each, uh, some, you know, exercises about each excerpt, how to do that. And then there's a module for music and piano, so you can play along with a really nice piano, a digital, you know, 
a digital panel, but it's it's a high probably the highest level digital panel you'll ever hear with with uh, phrasing with a lot pl allowing places to breathe uh, all that and then there's a module called play duets with me uh, there's drones for tuning and it goes on and on all my recordings uh, live recordings uh, and then there's a monthly webinar that we do uh, you know where all the subscribers will come and and we'll either hear them hear some of them play or we'll talk about an aspect of playing mm. That sounds incredible. So I'll have all of this yeah. information in the show notes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Joe Alessi, I'm so grateful of this gift of your time and wisdom today. It was so wonderful to get to speak to you. Thank you, Renee. And it's a pleasure to uh, be here on your show. Thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Joseph Alessi. Visit slideareacom to find all the information about Joe's activities and resources, including his upcoming performances and how to join his incredible Alessi Music Studio. You can also find this at alessimusicstudios.com. Of course, I have all those links for you in the show notes. And also in the show notes, you'll find the links to all things Music Mastery Experience. The Music Mastery Experience is the coaching program for musicians. It's my life-changing, highly personalized group coaching program where I take you through a massive transformation that's going to have you feel certainty in the practice room, experience joy and freedom in performance, gain the confidence you've always wanted, and know how to go about creating the career you've been dreaming of. No more indecision, band-aids, and short-term solutions. The Music Mastery Experience is unlike any other program out there because we go beyond the strategies and methods, which you'll get plenty of, of course, but we get to the root cause of issues, we unlock everything that's keeping you stuck, and you'll start experiencing amazing results, not only on stage, but at every level of your music-making experience and your life we cover everything from practice methods that work to performance preparation strategies that have you perform with confidence and mind management techniques that will remove all the obstacles and self-limiting beliefs that hold you back. You're going to see results from our first session and you will not believe what you're able of accomplishing within the short amount of time. And the Music Mastery Experience is radical because once you're in, you're in for life. That's right. Once you join, you will have constant support months after months to keep reaching new heights. All of this is done in a small private environment where you will feel supported, inspired, and motivated. So if you have big dreams, big plans, and you're ready for more in your musical life, book a call today at mindoverfinger.com and let's make it happen. Don't forget to share today's episode with everyone you think might benefit from Joe's insight and tag me so I can say hi. I'm mind over finger everywhere. So that's what I have for you today. Be well, my friends. Once again, thank you so much for listening. And à bientôt.